climate change. It's one of the biggest threats to human development, threatening the lives of not only humans, but also Earth's extraordinary biodiversity. Heat waves, floods, droughts, increased intensity of weather events, rising sea levels, and the melting of polar ice caps and glaciers are just some of the impacts currently felt across the globe. Don't believe me? Let's take a look at Australia. According to the Bureau of Meteorology, by 2070, there will be a temperature increase of up to five degrees Celsius. Increased temperatures have led to heat waves, which in turn have led to increased energy and water demands and fires, all of which are expected to increase in frequency and intensity. For example, there has been a 50% decline in rainfall since 1975. Global temperatures as a whole have led to ocean temperature warming of 0.1 degrees Celsius. Although this may seem small in comparison to global temperatures, it has largely changed the dynamics of oceans, affecting many flora and fauna species. This rise, of course, has created havoc across the globe, especially in low-lying areas and island communities where coastal habitats are inundated, shoreline erosion increases, and the power of storm surges magnified. Australia also faces flooding, often occurring during extreme weather events, leading to community displacements, contaminated drinking water, injuries from moving objects, loss of crucial infrastructure such as transport and telecommunication, and ultimately, loss of life. Rainfall, temperature and sea level have all also been found to positively correlate with infectious waters from disease spread. These impacts will have devastating effects on groups most at risk, including Indigenous Australians in remote communities who are vulnerable due to their traditional and cultural practices, which rely upon natural systems. Climate change is also likely to negatively impact agricultural production, not only in Australia, but worldwide in the future. Heat waves have caused devastating agricultural losses to many regional economies, which is exasperated by the effects of increased spread of tropical diseases. Global population growth over the next few decades could lead food insecurity, not only in Australia, but across the globe. Warmer temperatures will also put pressure on animal species, many of which may not be able to adapt and survive to rising temperatures. It has been reported that one in four species could be extinct by 2050. If this is the case, human development will seriously be affected as we rely heavily on the functions and products derived from animal and plant systems. So, what can be done? There are two main ways of overcoming the impacts of climate change, adaption and mitigation. As of 2010, China is the highest CO2 emitter in the world, contributing to 23% of the world's total CO2 emissions. The US follow closely, contributing 19%, whilst Australia ranks in at number 14, behind Saudi Arabia, for CO2 emissions per capita. Many industries contribute to these CO2 emissions. According to the United States Environmental Protection Agency, the electricity sector contributes to 31% of greenhouse gas emissions. In order to reduce these emissions, decoupling our dependency on fossil fuels and moving towards renewable energy sources such as solar, hydrothermal, geothermal, wind and biomass is essential whilst governments should be crediting this shift. From using renewable energy sources, in 2009, the European Union alone reduced their CO2 emissions by 340 million tonnes against the 1990 levels. Transportation is also a high CO2 emitter, contributing 27% of total emissions in the US alone. In order to reduce these emissions, better transport, including more public transport, less polluting cars and land use planning, is vital, where there should be more areas for non-motorised transport, such as cycling, Biomimicry, the act of copying the process of nature to achieve sustainable solutions to problems preventing human development, is another approach that could be incorporated into future transport systems. For example, in 1999, Japanese engineers modelled the bullet train, inspired by kingfishers, a bird species found in many areas of the world. This train is more aerodynamic than standard trains and 10 to 15% more energy efficient. The agriculture industry also contributes to a high portion of CO2 emissions, although it also provides solutions such as creating carbon sinks on grazing land. 
Resource productivity is another solution that can be incorporated into energy, service and agriculture industries. Resource productivity looks at service or products and how they can be used to ultimately gain more with less environmental impacts. Of all solutions, whole system design, a design approach to ultimately maximise energy efficiency whilst reducing negative environmental impacts in the long run has huge potential in reducing CO2 emissions in many sectors. Consider a house for example. It is many independent parts each contributing to the efficiency of the system. In order to meet the requirements of the whole system design approach, every aspect needs to be considered from the start of the design process. Just by considering and optimising facts such as glazing and shading, orientation and the use of energy efficient electrical appliances in order to regulate home temperatures, energy requirements can be reduced by 29% over 30 years. This approach can be incorporated not only in houses and buildings, but when designing any system to ultimately reduce the amount of energy used along with energy that is wasted. These mitigative strategies alone, however, will not solve the problem. They are also partnered with adaptive strategies. Sea level rise, for example, is inevitable, no matter how much we mitigate. So, strategies that reduce human exposure, including early warning systems, better energy and evacuation techniques, better housing, encompassing the whole system design approach, more shelters, more natural barriers along the storm surge seawall barriers, and ultimately relocation of infrastructure and people in coastal areas will reduce these impacts. Another adaption in countries such as Australia, where there are finite water supplies, will be to diversify dam-based supplies to include treated water, water recycling, desalinised seawater, and to educate people to change behaviours. For people who are more exposed to climate events, such as Indigenous communities in Australia, encouraging economic development will be important, along with addressing social inequalities such as education. Agriculture industries also have many adaptive options, including adaptive crops, crop rotation, improved fertiliser application, genetic modification and selective breeding of crops and livestock that are more tolerant and adapt well to harsh climates. Governments across the globe ultimately need to be crediting renewable energy producers and users. For high emitting industries, taxes need to be enforced for carbon use. Regulations need to be maintained, as well as incentives given to the companies that comply with better management practices and implementation of strategies. Governments should also aim to create jobs and encourage people into renewable energy sectors. This could help with the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Decoupling economic development from fossil fuel industries, having better production efficiency, taking on whole system design approaches, mimicking the highly advanced functions of nature, along with key adaptive strategies that will ensure that human development is not impacted and future generations can ultimately live in a healthier environment.